Released by Rose Engine in October of 2022, Signalis is a survival horror game that takes inspiration from the classics of the genre from the early 2000s. The story of the game follows an android named Elster as she makes her way past various monsters and creatures and through unsettling creepy environments, searching for someone important to her. Someone that she made a promise to. However, during that journey, the line between dream and reality is often blurred, making it difficult to understand just what is going on in the story. But scattered throughout the buildings she traverses are various notes and journals that not only flesh out the background of the world, but help clarify the craziness that she experiences. Let's go through that information and attempt to clear up some of the mystery surrounding the story of Signalis. Also, before I begin, I just want to say that you should really do yourself some justice and play through the game, or at least watch a playthrough of it before watching this video. My attempt at telling the story will come nowhere close to capturing the experience of playing the game, and that's honestly the best way the story is experienced. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get started. The story starts in an unnamed planetary system somewhere out in the reaches of space. Vibrating through this planetary system, and indeed through the whole of the universe, was a strange inexplicable power known as bioresonance. All things in the universe were tuned to this power, the brightly burning stars, the rocks and stones, the planets and moons, and the life of the beings that called these worlds home. Beings that were all connected together through the song of the universe. While most of these life forms were unaware of the beating music that played through them in the universe, there were a few that could hear the harmony of the cosmos. But they typically feared the tune as they could feel its power, hearing and feeling the emotions of their peers, but could do nothing to control it. However, there were a rare few that could do just that, conducting the music to manipulate the very essence of the universe to their whims. And on one of the planets of the system, a blue marble of a planet named Veneta, lived one of these conductors. It was a woman that came to be known as the Empress, and she used her control of bioresonance, which allowed her to tap into the minds and thoughts of her peers, to influence, dominate, and consolidate the Venetan people, cultures, and societies into one combined empire, the Yusan Empire, with her at its head. However, not content with just the dominion of Veneta, the Empress did the impossible and led her civilization to the stars, colonizing the worlds of the planetary system. Cities were established in the red deserts of Katesh, the outward neighbor of Veneta. Strongholds, factories, and homes were built on Rotfront and Heimat. The icy moons of large gas giants passed the orbit of Katesh and a grand imperial palace was built above the toxic clouds of Buyan, the planet closest to the system star. This colonization effort was made possible thanks to incredible, never-before-seen technologies that were only possible due to the bioresonant control that the Empress and the Empire had. Technologies like induced gravity, which stabilized the effects of the innate force on the bodies of the Venetans, and clima forming, which allowed the empire to make the environments of the world more habitable to their citizens. But perhaps the technology most essential for keeping the empire together was the power of the replicas. Replicas were androids that were used across the empire to perform certain jobs and roles in society, thus freeing up time for the members of the Yusan Empire to focus on other tasks. The job that a replica was assigned to do depended on their manufacture, a process that used a bioresonant technology to implant a neural template of a Yusan citizen, also called a Gestalt, into their chassis, both of which were carefully selected to optimize the job the replica would perform. There were replicas like the Oila that were responsible for domestic tasks like cooking, cleaning, and nursing. There were replicas called Mina that were used for work in hazardous environments, like mining in some of the outer worlds of the system. The Storch and Star units were replicas used for security and protection, and as such were also called protectors throughout the Empire. There were even replicas that could use bioresonance themselves, like the Calibri who could tune into all the other replicas to keep tabs on their status or keep morale up, or the imposing Falk unit. Replicas used as the commanders of protector units, who could impose their will on weaker minds to get them to follow their orders. 
Although the technology of the replicas was wonderful and had a huge impact on the efficiency of the Empire, it was poorly understood, and as such, replicas manufactured by the process weren't perfect. If exposed to certain stimuli, a replica would begin to remember the memories of the Gestalt mind that made them. In the confusion of this phenomenon, where they had lived as one person, but started to remember being someone else, would cause them to degrade and eventually lose their mind. The stimuli that could trigger these memories were different based on the model of replica, as they depended on the neural template that was used to make them. For example, for Mina models, it was something as simple and benign as stuffed animals that resembled cats, while for Adler models, it was a sense of boredom. To prevent this degradation from happening, the replicas were allowed to perform certain activities and were given certain items that could stabilize their personalities. However, if things ever went too far, the replicas had to be decommissioned to prevent tragedy from occurring. Despite these challenges, however, the Empire was great at managing them, and with the replicas, the Yusan Empire ushered in a golden age that was unrivaled to anything else in history. But all good things come to an end, and eventually, after an untold amount of years, a group of dissenters arose from the colony of Hymat and rebelled against the Empire using their own technology, like the replicas, against them. As these rebels, who called themselves the Yusan Nation, grew in power, they created a society that was incredibly authoritative and restrictive, banning several books, songs, and movies for being sympathetic to the Empire, constantly monitoring all its citizens with numerous cameras all over their cities to find any Empire spies or sympathizers, and pushing out a ton of propaganda to keep its populace motivated to defy the Empire. Their grip on their citizens was not only so they could keep them under their control, but also so they could use them as a weapon against the Empire, as their rebellion soon turned into a full-scale war against it. And to have the soldiers needed to fight this battle, the nation forcibly conscripted its citizens into its military when they came of age. Although these methods seemed harsh, the nation actually had a good measure of success in the fighting, as not only had they been able to wrest control of Hymat from the Empire, but they also managed to take control of Lang and Rotfront as well. With control of the outer part of the system firmly in their grasp, the nation then turned their eyes on the inner part, specifically on Veneta, the planet where humanity's colonization effort began. After brutal fighting, where countless soldiers and civilians were killed and entire cities were leveled with devastating bombs, the nation was able to oust the Empire from its homeworld and take control of the planet. Despite this victory, however, Veneta was nestled between two planets held by the Empire, and though its surface was controlled by the nation, the Empire kept a strong blockade around the planet preventing much-needed supplies from the other Yusan Nation planets from reaching Veneta. Likewise, the nation used its foothold on Veneta to bomb Kitesh and Buyan, clearly intent on not giving up the planet without a fight. Although diplomatic relations were established between the two interplanetary powers, tensions were still high, and an end to the fighting did not seem to be coming soon. One of the soldiers that had been caught up in the fighting particularly in the brutal campaign on Veneta, was a woman named Lilith Ito. Lilith was a commendable soldier, not only being a capable and adaptable fighter, but having the mental fortitude to withstand harsh survival situations that would break most people. She was so lauded that her mind was used as the neural template for a new replica unit, the Elster unit, which was used for long-term isolation-type missions, such as scouting, where their stoic, lonesome nature, inherited from Lilith, gave them an ability to complete these missions where other replicas or gestalts would be overcome by the harrowing, isolating conditions. While Lilith was a loner, there was one soldier in her unit that she had a strong bond with, a soldier named Alina So. Her bond with Alina was so strong that, even after the two went their separate ways, Lilith kept a photo the two had taken together as a memento from their time spent as soldiers. When Lilith's military service ended, she moved to Rotfront, opened a bookstore in the colony, and became a mother, giving birth to twin daughters, Isolde and Erika, nicknamed Isa and Eri, respectively. 
After a number of years, when the twins had become teenagers and would soon graduate school and enter their military service, a girl moved in with the family that ran a photo shop not far from their store. A girl named Arianne Young, who was not like the other girls on Rotfront. Arianne was raised by her mother on a remote radio station on Rotfront, and being so far from the iron grip of the Yusan nation, she had a measure of freedom that most other citizens didn't have. As such, she developed interests in subjects that were considered taboo by the nation as a whole. Subjects like painting, music, and stories. She had been moved to Rotfront at the insistence of her aunt, who had convinced her mother that it was best for Arianne to enroll in the school on the colony so she could have a somewhat normal upbringing, at least what the nation thought was normal. And once she arrived, Arianne found it incredibly difficult to adjust to the restrictive society she was now forced to live in. Although she was to have a normal school experience, due to her strangeness, she didn't fit in with the others at school and was even bullied by them. The only reprieve she had from her misery was her friendship with the Itos. But when the twins were conscripted into the military, Arianne was left alone on Rotfront. And to make matters worse, judging by a memorial set up in the Ito bookshop, where a picture of each girl had a black ribbon displayed in the corner, her only friends died at some point in their military service. It was around this time that Arianne came across the picture of Lilith Ito and Alina So, and she was dumbstruck by her remarkable similarity to Alina. Even her mother was surprised at the similarity, remarking at the crazy coincidence that they could look so similar and yet not be related, at least not in a way that she knew of. Seeing the picture of Alina smiling beside her friend caused Arianne to imagine what Alina's life was like, how different and better it must have been to her own. And as she entered and suffered through her compulsory military service, those feelings and thoughts she had only deepened in her mind. By the time she was through with her compulsory service, Arianne had become completely sick of her life in the Yusan Nation and desperately wanted to escape from it, to be in a place where she could just be herself. Her next assignment was originally going to be to work in the Sierpinski 23 facility on Lang, but driven by her fierce desire to escape, she signed up for the Penrose program, a program of the Yusan Nation that searched for other habitable planets and moons out in space. The isolation offered by the mission was by far the biggest draw for Arianne. She would finally be in a place where she could do whatever she wanted when she wanted, free from judgment. She would finally be alone. Perhaps due to her experience as a long-range radio transmitter, a skill she picked up from her youth, Arianne was accepted into the program. After some short goodbyes, she boarded the Penrose 512 and was launched out of the planetary system in search for resources or new habitable worlds. As expected, once the Penrose took off, Arianne didn't bother reading all the manuals and instructions and schematics to ensure the ship was properly maintained. Instead, using her newfound freedom to paint and dance and watch movies and do everything she wished she could do before leaving the care and upkeep of the vessel's various components, like the cryopod and the fuel reactor, to her onboard replica companion, an Elster unit whose stoic nature was the perfect fit for dealing with the isolating conditions of the Penrose program. Elster's naturally reserved nature was a perfect fit for Ariane as well, as at first she didn't want any company, relishing in the isolation afforded to her by the mission. But as the days wore on and on, Marianne began to hate how everything on the ship was always the same. Everything, except for Elster. Eventually, driven by intense loneliness, Arianne approached Elster. Their interaction started a small talk, with Arianne being fascinated by Elster's accent, noting it was the same one the Ito twins had. Soon, Arianne was doing things for Elster to make the ship more comfortable for her, like changing the ship's clock to simulate the length of a day on Veneta. Then, Elster was helping Arianne paint. 
and Ariane was showing Elster movies and photos from the war, and they were listening to music and dancing together. Every single one of these activities were ones that were strictly forbidden to do with Elsters, as, according to the overview manual for the units, they were the stimuli that were known to cause Gestalt memories to emerge and compromise their minds. But Ariane had never read the manual, leaving it unopened in a room on the ship. And besides, it felt so good to interact with someone after so long. Elster didn't resist her advances either, which could have been due to the memories of Lilith within Elster compelling her to reciprocate Ariane's advances, since she looked so much like Alina. Thus, what started as accepted tolerance of each other eventually blossomed into a full-blown relationship, with the two falling in love there on the Penrose. However, despite the emergence of their love for each other, as the days continued to wear on and on, Ariane still felt the crushing weight of the isolation of their mission. Additionally, she began to notice that she would feel weak, sickly, and unfocused. Symptoms she attributed to her contempt for their claustrophobic home, but as the days went on and the mission approached its 3,000th day, her breathing became labored and her muscles became sore and achy, and her hair started to fall out, hinting that something else was going on. Ariane and Elster had also noticed that some parts of the ship had begun acting up and their rations and food supplies were running low, but they soldiered on and kept focused, hoping to make it to day 3000 of their mission. It was a significant one, as that was when they would enter the third and final phase of the Penrose program and receive new parameters from the Yusan Nation. But whatever idea the two had of the mission coming to an end, whereupon they could have a peaceful post-mission life together, were dashed when they received their new orders. To their dismay, the mission parameters explained that if they had not found somewhere to land by now, they likely never would. And that, with their rations running out and their ship breaking down, the nation recommended that they should not extend their anguish and to accept their fate, even recommending that Elster execute Ariane to save her from her misery. The orders came as a complete shock, and suddenly it became clear where Ariane's sickness was coming from. The reactor for the ship had begun to break down, leaking radioactive coolant that was causing cancer to emerge in her body. Despite the hopelessness of their situation, the two seemingly decided to go on living, refusing to just roll over and die, going on for over 2,000 more days. But as they did so, Ariane just got sicker and more miserable. Eventually, Ariane asked Elster to end her suffering, made her promise to do so. Normally, due to their stoicism, an Elster unit would be able to follow through on this order, on this promise. But Ariane's Elster couldn't. She had built a bond with Ariane through the time they spent together, and thus wasn't that cold, distant soldier that could follow through with any order anymore. She was Ariane's lover, and Elster just couldn't bring herself to kill her love. This hesitance may have been further compounded by Gestalt memories emerging within Elster and Ariane's resemblance to Alina So. Perhaps memories of Lilith emerged in Elster's mind that prevented her from killing Ariane because she looked so much like Alina. In any case, despite promising to end Ariane's misery, Elster kept putting it off and putting it off until eventually she died to the radiation emanating from the reactor, tragically before Ariane did. Thus, Ariane was left alone once again, and although she was miserable and hated being alive, she couldn't bring herself to end her life, so she retreated into the cryopod aboard the ship and entered a cycle of sleep and wakefulness. She wallowed like this for an unknown time, not dying, but not living either, just existing. And that's when things took a strange turn.
Now, I'm going to take a moment real quick to point out that from this point on, the telling of the story of the game is pretty subjective, as the following events are subject to various interpretations. While I believe the theory I'm about to lay out has pretty good legs to stand on, keep in mind that it's only one of many possible interpretations, and thus it may not line up with your own. If you have an interpretation that you'd like to share, feel free to. It's possible your ideas and theories could help clear things up for me, or someone else. And if it helps someone, then it was definitely worth sharing. But with that out of the way, let's get back to the story. Arianne had always felt that she was useless and insignificant. In fact, it was partly those feelings that led her to the Penrose program to begin with. But there was actually something incredibly special about her. She was bioresonant, with powers that may have even surpassed the level of the Yusan Empress. These powers had always lay dormant within her, barely detectable even by the Yusan nation. The only person that picked up on her power was a spy from the empire that had fled Rotfront around the time she was at the colony. And now, with Arianne having been left alone on the Penrose, pushed to the brink of death, that bioresonant power surged from within her, interacting with her mind to create a dream world. Making up the world were various environments that were built upon her memories, like a rendering of the Penrose that she and Elster had lived on for so long, and built upon her dreams, like a nightmarish environment known as Nowhere full of fleshy masses that seemed to symbolize not only the darkest parts of her mind, but the cancerous growths that were spreading in her own body. Strangely included among these environments, built atop the nightmare section of Nowhere, was a full rendering of the Sierpinski facility complete with a replica staff that was stationed there. Even stranger was the fact that these replicas seemed to go about their days as if they lived in the real world. Arianne had never been to the Sierpinski in person, which begged the question of how did the rendering of the facility make it into her dream world? While it's possible she could have dreamed up the entire location using her thoughts and assumptions, there was another possibility. Using her bioresonance, which flowed through the entire universe, she could have tapped into the minds of other bioresonance sensitive beings, beings like replicas back in the planetary system, and built the facility using their memories, populating it with replications of the replicas that were stationed on the real Sierpinski. In any case, whether created solely from her mind or being a conglomeration of her dreams and memories along with the dreams and memories of other bioresonant beings, what was clear was that there were a series of environments that were at the whims of Arianne's bioresonant powers, and through these environments walked another relic of Arianne's mind, her lover, Elster. Impressed upon the mind of Elster was the need to find somebody close to her, and she searched through the various dream environments to find this person. However, despite being made by Arianne's mind, Elster was not looking for her, but Alina so, a mix-up that may have emerged from the remnants of Lilith's memories existing in the bioresonant template of Elster's mind, but may have also emerged from Arianne's obsession with Alina, conflating their identities together and confusing Elster's mind. Either way, Elster began her search in the Penrose, and after making her way through a square stone gate and a replication of Arianne's radio room from her home on Rotfront, she found herself in the Sierpinski, whereupon she descended through it and through the labyrinthine halls of the nightmarish area of nowhere to seemingly come back to where she started, passing through the square stone gate and coming to the Penrose. However, upon her return to the ship, she regained all of her memories, remembering who she was truly searching for and the promise she made to Arianne, and then would once again go through Arianne's dream world to fulfill her promise, but this time going through Rotfront instead of the Sierpinski. She didn't make this journey one time though, she made it multiple times, and each time she would fail either by dying before fulfilling her promise, or giving it up completely. And when this happened, she would be reset, starting her journey over from the beginning, forced to go through it again, forever looping, until 
she fulfilled her promise. However, strangely, while the dream world seemed to reset along with her, reverting all the replicas and environments back to their original states and memories, Elster's previous bodies would remain where they were, reminders of her failures from previous loops. Additionally, as Elster went through more and more cycles of her journey, something strange began to happen to the Adler unit in the Sierpinski. He began to have several moments of deja vu, where things were very similar to something he was sure he'd experienced before, with a detail or two changed or different. It was incredibly disturbing, and then he was further unsettled when he started to remember encounters he'd had with a white-haired girl or an Elster unit, but at the same time knew that he had never seen either of them before in his life. He racked his mind trying to understand what was happening to him, sensing that the depths below the Sierpinski were the key to it all. And then, he figured it out. He realized he was in a loop, and those moments of deja vu and his memories of people he'd never met before was him remembering events from previous realities, previous cycles of Elster's journey through the facility. The realization tore at his mind, destabilizing it and causing him to act in weird ways. During one particular cycle, or perhaps in more of them, the Falk unit of the Sierpinski was lured to the depths of the dream world, perhaps by the Adler unit, and came upon the gate that led to the Penrose. Intrigued, she crossed the threshold, and when she came upon the ship, all of the memories of Elster rushed into her head. However, unlike Elster, whose purpose was clarified when she went through this, Falk was left incredibly confused. Having Elster's memories meant she felt the love for Ariane and the compulsion to find her just like Elster did, but she also had all of her own memories and the desires and compulsions that came with them. Being caught between identities like this caused Falk to destabilize and eventually become sick. Her illness was so debilitating that all she did was lay in her bed, unable to perform any of the duties she normally did to keep the facility running. Without her guidance, along with Adler's strange behavior from his own destabilization, things got hard for the Sierpinski, and then they got even worse. An illness began to spread through the facility, infecting Replica and Gestalt alike. It began as nausea, headaches, and dehydration, but patients soon began to experience sharp cognitive decline and their skin began to peel from their bodies. Any gestalt affected with the sickness quickly died from it, their bodies dissolving into nothing with only shadows on the walls and floors showing evidence of their previous physical existence. While replicas expired from the illness as well, they also had another reaction. Their physical bodies would never dissolve away, but continue to deteriorate, giving them a terrifying, monstrous appearance. And due to the cognitive decline they experienced, they would become highly aggressive and attack those around them, necessitating a decommission by force. Follow-up autopsies performed on these sick replicas showed that their insides were being ravaged by cancerous growths, growths that, to the horror of the medical examiner, were found could cause the decommissioned units to come back online and continue their attack. In a way, it seemed like the replica's sickness was a manifestation of the suffering that Ariane herself was going through, being stricken with cancer and yet being unable to die. The only way to truly kill the replicas affected with this cancerous illness was to burn their bodies. Luckily, the Sierpinski had an incinerator on site which was able to do this task. But as the number of sick replicas began to increase dramatically, the bodies couldn't be burned fast enough, so a new solution was improvised, using thermal flares to burn the replica bodies to prevent their reanimation. Although Adler had been trying to keep order in the Sierpinski, the sickness laying waste the facility was the straw that broke the camel's back, and everything was thrown into full-blown chaos. He reflected on when the sickness first came up, after Falk came back from her trip through the gate. The gate that, through his memories of past cycles, he remembered was the destination of Elster. 
This led him to conclude that it was not a disease or poison that Falk had brought back from beyond the gate, but was something linked to Elster's journeys through the facility, the loops she was making over and over again. He believed they were causing a breakdown of reality itself, a breakdown that would eventually tear the world apart. In a way, he was right, as if a manifestation of Elster could ever reach Arianne and fulfill her promise to end her suffering, then Arianne's dream world would cease to exist. Refusing to let that happen, Adler became antagonistic to Elster, vowing to stop her by any means necessary if he came across her in her journey. It was at this point that a new Elster started a new loop, making her familiar trek through the Sierpinski, this time having to fight through and dodge the monsters that filled its dark halls, and survive an assassination attempt by Adler. Something else that was new in this loop was the presence of Arianne's old friend, Issa, who was making her way through the facility, searching for her twin sister, Ari, something she was determined to do alone. Issa appeared to be an anomaly in the loop, placed here by Arianne's memories instead of an association with the location, as when she was alive, Issa had never been stationed on the Sierpinski. Additionally, Adler, who had memories of so many previous cycles, didn't seem to recognize her or have memory of her. However, he quickly associated her with Elster and her loops, and as such, quickly moved to kill her. Although Issa had to fight him off on her own, stabbing him in the face with a knife, she and Elster did team up at one point to fight off a horrifying chimera creature that attacked her in nowhere. But despite being saved by Elster, Issa was still determined to find her sister on her own, so Elster continued on her own journey. When Elster made it to the submerged Penrose, she failed to access the ship, tearing her arm off and dealing significant damage to her chassis in the process, seemingly failing in her quest once again. However, before she passed completely and was reset once again, the memory of her promise to Arianne came to her mind. It strengthened her resolve, and when she looked up, she found herself by the Penrose, but the one that looked more like the one at the start of her journey rather than the end. When she made it inside, she came across one of her past selves slumped over the ship's cryopod, which had a mass of flesh writhing within it. Elster was in pretty bad shape and still needed to go through with her journey, so she pilfered parts off her previous self and continued on, returning to the Sierpinski, now covered with the masses of flesh which seemed to spread from nowhere below, and then eventually coming to Rotfront. Here, she came upon Issa one last time, who had come to the realization that her sister was dead that she would never see her again. Elster then watched as Issa dissolved into nothing, a victim of the cancerous sickness that was affecting everything in the dream world. Elster continued on, crawling through a hole in the wall to come once again to Arianne's radio room. She picked up the king in yellow, breaking the seal upon the door, allowing her to leave the dream world forever. However, before she could return once again to the Penrose, she had one last obstacle to face, Falk. As a result of the sickness that had affected everyone else, she had come to the conclusion that she would never be with Arianne again and attacked Elster in an attempt to become whole again. Despite Falk's incredible bioresonant powers, Elster was able to fight her off by stabbing her in the face with six spears. Elster then continued to the gate and came upon Adler, himself mutated by the sickness infesting the dream world. He made one last plea to Elster to stop her from continuing on. But when it became clear she wasn't going to stop, he stabbed her in the face. Elster shot him in response, and as he lay dying upon the threshold of the gate, he could do nothing to stop Elster from continuing on. What happened next depended on the actions Elster took in her most recent adventure through Arianne's dream world. If she was conservative with her resources, kept her health high, and avoided fighting the monsters, then despite everything she'd just gone through, she wouldn't have the willpower to see Arianne again. 
to fulfill her promise. So she wandered out into the desolate emptiness surrounding the Penrose, eventually succumbing to her wounds, standing as a reminder of yet another failure in future cycles. If she had rushed through the cycle, ignoring friend and foe alike, hurrying on with a single-minded purpose to reach Ariane at Journey's End, then she would enter the Penrose and come upon Ariane lying in the cryopod. However, perhaps due to the decay of the dream world, brought about by the cancer and sickness raging within it and Ariane as well, Ariane no longer recognized Elster or remembered the promise. And without her insistence, Elster couldn't follow through with it, instead slumping over Ariane's cryopod, thankful to be close to her, eventually passing from her wounds and serving as the corpse that would give a future Elster the parts needed to survive. If Elster was aggressive and combative in her adventure, never giving up despite the adversity in front of her, then when she entered the Penrose and came upon Ariane, she would remember her promise and have the willpower to carry it out, thus ending the cycle and finally giving Ariane the rest and release that had eluded her for so long. However, these were not the only ways the story could end. In the radio room just before the fight with Falk was a safe chained up and locked with three padlocks. If, during her previous journey through Ariane's dream world, Elser had her radio tuned to a specific frequency at particular areas, then she could find the keys to these locks. The key of love was on a body in the torture room of the Sierpinski. The key of eternity lied on a bookshelf next to a painting in the storch dorms on the eighth floor of the facility. And the key of sacrifice was in a box on one of the shelves in the back of the Ito bookshop. Once the chains were removed, Elster had to key in a code to unlock the safe, the code being the broadcast of numbers she heard when she first set out on her journey. Finally unlocked, the contents of the safe were revealed to be a pot of white lilies. Upon picking up the flowers, Elster was transported to a ritual site, where she placed the lilies upon one of six pillars jutting out of the ground. An image that echoed a glimpse of a memory she received when she regained all her previous ones, perhaps suggesting that Lilith may have done something similar to this for Alina in the past. Elster then collapsed, and at the base of each pillar was another version of herself, possibly previous versions that had completed the same ritual. The pillars all surrounded a low pedestal that had a strange artifact glowing with a luminous light. Exactly what this ritual was for and what it did wasn't exactly clear, except for one result. In the clouds above a crashed Penrose, a gigantic red eye, apparently a power that heard the ritual, looked upon the ship, where inside, Elster and Ariane danced together, both apparently healthy and happy, free from the cycle of misery both of them had been caught in for an untold amount of time. And with that, the story of Signalis comes to an end. When all laid out like this, it's pretty clear to see the influence of games like the early Resident Evils and Silent Hills that inspired the design and story of Signalis, and the game is a true love letter to those earlier titles. Now again, I want to reiterate that this interpretation of the events of Signalis is only one of many, and there are countless others that are just as valid as this one. For example, there are people that believe that the game doesn't take place in a separate dream world, but in the real world, and all the surreal things happening in the game, the replicas falling sick, the nightmarish environment of nowhere, the looping that Elster goes through, are not only happening in the real world Sierpinski and Rotfront, but in other areas of the Yusan Nation as well. Effects of Ariane's incredibly powerful bioresonance that seem destined to lead to the downfall of the Yusan Nation. There are also people that believe that the red eye seen and mentioned throughout the game isn't a reference to Ariane's eyes, 
but as some sort of eldritch god or deity that was lying beneath this year Pinsky and was awoken in some way, and the characters are just trapped in some sort of cosmic game put on by this entity. In this interpretation, the artifact ending could be pleasing the god in some way, which leads to them breaking the cycle. There are plenty of others that I know I missed, but that's one of the wonderful things about Signalis. Everyone can look at it and see the same thing, but they can all come to different conclusions on what those things mean. It's how you know that Signalis is a true piece of art. Now I didn't cover everything in the game, there's some first person dream sequences I didn't talk about and a ton of symbolism behind a lot of the things in the game that can be talked about for hours, but this should hit most of the story points of this interpretation of the story. If you're still confused or have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Likewise, as I said before, feel free to share any theories or thoughts of your own. I know I'd love to hear them and maybe it would help someone else understand the events of the game better. Before I go, I'd like to remind you that you can listen to the audio of every video on the channel over on Spotify, so feel free to listen over there if that's easier for you. But, yep, that's it for this one. Until next time, thank you for watching, and see you later.